So let's get started. I'm just going to get the mic on here. Okay. So how's the week for everybody? Um, I was dressed a little different today when I went to work. I had a nice shirt on, a nice dress shirt. And um, I had an extra sweater in my office. It's, sometimes it's cold, so I want to you know, be able to put a sweater on. And a guy came in with a cyst. Yesterday, it was a, a splinter in the finger. And I was like, I was on time. Five minute wait for me, which is rare. I was so proud. And then this lady said, yeah, here to go over my hormones with you, but they're fine. I just got this little splinter in my, my finger right here. I said, oh, I don't see anything. But if you think it's there, we're going to have to numb your finger and dig and see if we can find it. So after spending 20 minutes looking for the tools all over the hospital and then coming back and gently digging and looking, I said, I don't see there, think there's anything there. And my medical, I took my gloves off and my medical assistant squeezed and she said, I think there's something there. And we just, this big splinter came out. So then I was like 45 minutes behind, <laughs> typical me. And then today it was the same way. I was doing great. Um, the first patient has this cyst on his back about this big. And I said, I think we probably ought to get rid of that. So I was, I was numbing it. It's a sebaceous cyst. Have you ever had one of those? They, they have this oily, stinky s stuff. And as I squirted the anesthetic in, there was a pore that shot right at me and hit my arm. And that oily, stinky stuff was all over my arm, and I couldn't get it off. <laughs> I washed it with, you know, oh, it's ugly. And it still, it still smells, my arm still smells like it's there. <laughs> So this isn't what, it may not be color coordinated, but it doesn't stink. <laughs> so hopefully you guys had a good week. Um, the Facebook posts are great. Uh, I salivate when I see what you guys are eating. I'm thinking, I need to go to your house. Uh, so how did this go this, this last week? Um, the, the nutritional challenges I gave you, not eating uh, three hours before bedtime, that's kind of tough, right? Most of us are like, I had a rough day. Don't tell me I can't have popcorn or you know s some snack. Um, and then uh, not eating breakfast and, and trying to get your fruits and vegetables. How was that part of it for you? Were you able to get the fruits and vegetables? More than usual, right? Some of you aren't nodding your head. <laughs> OK. Well, that's the goal. We're just trying to make better and better choices and improve each each day. Uh, and then somebody, uh, I comment on, somebody had a bad day, I forget who it was, but it's like, it's okay. You're allowed to have a bad day. Uh, I found a couple of articles I wanted to share with you. I was thinking, I was so excited to, for tonight, and I worked like crazy this morning trying to finish this PowerPoint so it's meaningful and give you some new content. and. I had a couple of studies I wanted to show you, but after I took a picture and loaded them on the computer, I couldn't find them, so I couldn't, I couldn't read it to tell you what was in the study. It was driving me crazy. But I did find a couple. And I thought it would be just good for you to see what the literature is telling us about some of the things we've talked about. So here's one of them. And this was uh, in Family Medicine last October. And the title is Gut Health vitally important to mental health. And I think I mentioned that to you before, that um, when we treat depression, we have to fix the gut first. I ha had a psychiatrist tell me that. I was shocked that, that she would say, that's why she came to this gut conference, because that was her experience. Well, here's a summary of studies, and this was just an article in the, in the Family uh, Practice News. And I just, I just took, uh, I highlighted a few lines here, the first paragraph or so. And this comes right out of the study. Evidence is mounting. Whoops, whoops, I'm sorry. Did I mess that up? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm reading two slides. Okay, disturbances in gut microbiota of anti-inflammatory uh, bacteria and proliferation of pro-inflammatory bacteria uh, is a pattern uh, tied to several major psychiatric disorders, including depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and, and anxiety. It's that new research shows. So they're just summarizing new research here last fall. So what they're saying is that there's some bacteria in your gut that are pro-inflammatory, that cause inflammation, and some bacteria that are anti-inflammatory. So you want the anti-inflammatory bacteria, right? 
So do you remember, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, how, how do you make your gut not healthy and, and get put pro-inflammatory bacteria in your gut? What would you have to feed those bacteria to make them unhealthy? Yeah, same things that make us unhealthy, right? Sugar, right? Fast foods. You'll, you'll change so the good bacteria will be, it's just like weeds in a garden. You, you give them sugar and the bad bacteria grow and the good bacteria, the good plants in your gut, they get kind of, they starved out because of all the weeds and the bad things that grow. And then they named the two types of bacteria that have anti-inflammatory properties, these first two, uh, I guess it's Fecali bacterium and Coprococcus, uh, have anti-inflammatory effects on the gut. So this is just a, a fairly uh, new um, report talking about how healthy, how a healthy gut can help us fight mental illness, which is pretty, you guys probably haven't heard that, but this is kind of out there. And mainstream medicine doesn't talk about it. Mainstream medicine probably won't tell you this. But, um, you know, there are, as far as mental illness, especially anxiety and depression, there are, there are events in life that make you feel bad and trigger memories and make you go to these places. But some of us, we just sort of gradually slip into this. And uh, if that's happened to you, you have to think about your gut. Is it a problem? Especially if you're bloated, uh, if you have constipation. I was just talking to a, a husband today coming here whose wife uh, has had problems with her gut for a, a long time. And she just had her gallbladder out. Feels a little bit better, but now she can't have bowel movement. She's, she's struggling to have a bowel movement. So I was trying to, he was wondering what do we do? Do we treat her for colitis or I said get her bowels moving first, but it's gonna take her a while to heal the gut. And she's suffering from depression and anxiety. Okay, there's a, this is another one. This kind of goes back to what we talked about. If you saw the video I posted with the water that, that I drank with, with the, the cloudy gas water, that's hydrogen gas. And you can't, you can't store that because that hydrogen gas doesn't stay there long. So you have to have, drink it fresh. And uh, the, uh, the angels have this machine and the beetles have it. I don't think you've met John and Pat, but we're going to try to maybe bring them in. Um, and I have this machine. So this study is not about the water, but it is a study that uh, says um, harnessing hydrogen's antioxidant property power to treat autoimmune diseases. Okay, so hydrogen is a very strong antioxidant, a very strong anti-inflammatory. That's why, to me, this water is so beneficial. But again, I just quoted right from this, uh, this report. And this was also, uh, that was the winter of 2019. It was a primary care report, so fairly recent. It says, evidence is mounting that hydrogen gas has potential benefits in the treatment of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions like psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. If somebody tells you you have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or lupus or any of these inflammatory problems, they're going to automatically put you on steroids or we call them disease modifying agents that have chemotherapeutic kind of effects. A lot of side effects with these. And the rheumatologists and internists, people that specialize in this, they just jump right to those. And what this does is it controls the fire in your body, but it doesn't put it out. It doesn't let your body heal. So functional medicine says, why is it inflamed and how do we put that fire of inflammation out? And so they go beyond what mainstream medicine does. So this is basically saying, hey, this is a, a, an option you might consider. Then it says hydrogen gas is a powerful antioxidant that easily and rapidly diffuses across cell membranes. I think you guys asked that uh, last week, something about the, the gas, how, how long was the nitrogen oxide gas um, or the hydrogen gas? And it goes fast, it goes, it goes quickly. And they have over 450 publications that have studied this and reported this. And then they said mild stressors like exercise and even uh, ischemia, which, which means low blood flow, which happens when you exercise. Your muscles are like, I'm, I need more oxygen, I need more blood here. And that stresses the body and the body says, we're either going to have to collapse or we're going to have to get better at getting blood flow here. So we have to make more nitric oxide to dilate the blood vessels um, and help the body recover. So those two triggers, exercise and mild ischemia, enhance 
these healthy responses and generally have a beneficial effect. So again, this is just a report talking about the fact that hydrogen gas is something that's being used clinically because it's very rich in antioxidants. I, what I didn't show you, I, I need a meter that's accurate, is when I, when I stick an oxidation reduction potential meter in that glass of water that I'm drinking, it comes back as a, a very negative millivolt value. So we're measuring millivolts, it's potential. It's electrical potential and it's very negative. Negative means it's high in antioxidant properties. Higher than vitamin C, like 10 times higher than vitamin C. If I stick that, if I use that same probe and stick it in tap water or bottled water or Gatorade, it's going to be oxidizing, so, which is inflammatory. Okay, so I need to show you that experiment. If you watched uh, Bob Gradelli, who was introduced by Pat Boone, that 30 minute video, you saw him do that. Um, I can re I get those same measurements with my meter, but my meter needs to be uh, cleaned and updated. So that's why I haven't shown you that yet. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Didn't hydrogen blow up the Hindenburg? Yes, it did. Is that gonna blow you up? No. No. It's. Uh, Light a match over the water and it'll burn. It's it, it it is combustible, right? Yeah. If you saw my video, you saw it. You heard it crackle. You could right. see sparks. It is combustible, but it's also unstable. Once it, it, ha it re interacts with the atmosphere, it, it degrades quickly. So uh, it's not going to do that in your body. But it tells you how much energy is stored in that gas, and it, it gives that energy to you to help energize your cells. Okay, and then the last one that I wanted to share with you was, um, this is a study about nitrite. Now, this is kind of interesting because I want your feedback on this. This was in the Journal of American Medical Association. Um, uh, I'm trying to see here. It was 2021, so it was last year. This is one of our top medical journals. Uh, oh, there it is, right there. <laughs> you guys are laughing at me, aren't you? <laughs> okay, so what, they, what they're showing is that Earlier studies with sodium nitrite was given to animals in cardiac arrest, and they had better survival rates when they did this. But this study said, we're going to see if this works in humans. So these are humans who have a cardiac arrest in the field, and they got to do something because they're dead. And they give them um, IV sodium nitrite. And their conclusion was uh, it didn't make any, it didn't help the humans survive. Okay, so my question is, first of all, why, why would it not? Because you guys know what nitrite converts to, right? What does it convert to? Nitric oxide. And you know what nitric oxide does, right? Dilates blood vessels, improves blood flow, oxygenation. It does all that. So why do you think this would not have worked? Yes? Okay, possibly, possibly. I mean, you can't always say, we, we can do this to animals because if they die, who cares? But we can't experiment with people, right? So that's why sometimes what we see in, in animals, we can't just say, oh, it's gonna work in humans because we don't know all the variables with animals. But what else do you know about nitric oxide? Yes, sir. It dissipates too fast in humans and in animals, it stays longer. Good explanation, that could be, yes. Yeah, actually, the, the nitrate, which this is not, nitrate uh, is converted in your mouth to nitrite. That's how you guys get, we get it. When you swallow the nitrite, it converts to nitric oxide. What has to do that? What re, what's required for the death? Acidic stomach, right? An acid stomach. Okay, so we're injecting nitrite into somebody's veins. Is there acid there? No, it's, it's alkaline pH. So is it surprising to you that this, this wouldn't show any favorable response? Like, I, I mean, it's not surprising to me. And you guys kind of could work through this because you had the right answers. So you see how people are interested. They know there's a connection, but you can't always jump from humans to animals. But then you got to think of physiology and how does the body do it. And Dr. What's his name, the guy with the nitric oxide that we talked about, Dr. Nathan Bryan. He's like, 
let me explain to you the biochemistry. This is how the body does it. This was not a, a, an application of good biochemistry. You, you wouldn't expect this to work. Everybody got that, right? You gotta, have, you gotta have acid to convert nitrite into nitric oxide. There's no acid in the, in the things. Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's uh, talk about, um, this is just, a, I'm gonna try to review this as quick as I can for you. I showed you the solar eclipse and how sometimes when the moon gets too close to earth, it eclipses the sun's light. And that, the analogy is when we start thinking about our problems, they get bigger and bigger and closer and closer to us. We, we don't see the light in our lives and it's all about how bad our lives are. We have to take a step back and look at the big picture. Um, but this is, a, this is another example here uh, about the cholesterol medicines and why they should only be used once heart disease is diagnosed. Not because you have high cholesterol. That's like putting that cholesterol right up here and if you don't fix that, you're gonna have a heart attack. It's absolutely not true because we know that it's not cholesterol that causes heart disease. Um, okay, so the consequences of doing this using cholesterol or the, the statins when you don't have heart disease. If you block cholesterol production, which is what statins do, you block uh, your lower testosterone levels, which if we, took, if we took a man's gonads out and blocked his testosterone, he has, this, he has the same things happen to him that women go through in menopause. So that would be fair for us, guys. <laughs> to understand the women, Let's knock out your gonads because we take away est estrogen from women and they gain weight. They get this belly fat that increases their risk for diabetes. Same thing happens for men. Okay, so why would you want to block a hormone that's helping men stay trim and feel good and keeping their belly weight down? Why would you want to block women's estrogen? They're not making much by the time they hit menopause. You block it even more because there's no cholesterol there. This same thing's going to happen. So... You can you see how taking a cholesterol medicine could potentially increase your risk for heart disease if you're otherwise healthy? Like, why would you do that? Well, because we want that cholesterol number to be good. Well, who cares? <laughs> You've got a good cholesterol number, but it doesn't mean you're not going to have a heart attack. Okay, they also, the cholesterol medicines also cause all these problems. And we know the remedy for that is replacing what it's, de it's uh, depleting, which is CoQ10. Um, so, do, why don't cholesterol uh, medicines uh, protect you from heart disease? You guys know this, right? It's not a cholesterol problem. What kind of a problem is it? Inflammation, Inflammation problem. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of research articles um, that are, they really believe ch cholesterol is the cure, um, but there's funding pressure. And all the studies, are, I'm not going to say all, but many, probably most of the studies that say, you need to take this new cholesterol medicine is funded by a pharmaceutical company. So they're already biased. Okay, and then it's not about cholesterol, it's about inflammation. So this is a picture of a cross-cut picture of an artery. The picture on the left uh, shows you the lining of the artery. It's, got the, it's called a glycocalyx, that's a healthy lining. Uh, when, you, when you lose that lining, then you start to develop uh, more cholesterol plaque and inflammation in your arteries. So here's what happens. So on the left there, you've got a nice healthy lining of your artery and the artery, the lining of the artery on the far right means you've destroyed that healthy lining and now cholesterol deposits can easily enter the lining there um, right here and then you get this inflammatory response because of the deposits. Okay, so we, I think we went over this once before. So this can happen, this process can happen within eight hours. It happens quickly on high fat, high sugar meals. But it also reverses quickly. You just gotta keep doing what you're doing. Not something you're gonna be able to feel, not something you're gonna be able to measure, just something to be aware of. If you have a bad day, you're kinda of messing this up, but get back and have a good day and it'll start to heal. Um, for two weeks, my elbow, I was really getting down because it was not improving. It, it was no improvement at all. And I saw the surgeon um, two, a week ago. He said, it's, it's a, you did a number on it, but give it time. 
And I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to trust it's going to get better. And, that, and I start putting heat on it and moving it, and it's now I can bend my arm. It's getting, it's much better a week later. It's a terrible feeling when you're, you're losing hope, right? Like, oh shoot, this isn't going to get better. I have, I have a feeling in my arm when I touch this, like somebody's got a wire brush scratching me. So there's a nerve problem there. But I'm trusting that that's going to get better, too, because the body knows how to heal itself. Um, it just took this a little bit longer because it was such a bad injury. But it's pretty amazing that our bodies can heal, and it doesn't take long. Okay, um, so how important is your gut? Uh, we know that gut was, is linked with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, psychosis. Um, Hippocrates was really wise. All disease begins in the gut. If you talk to functional medicine doctors, they'll tell you that. Treat the gut first. Let's figure out what happened in the gut. You got an autistic kid or a kid with ADD, let's fix their gut first. And often if you do that over time, you can reverse those issues. Maybe not autism so much, but I've seen Dr. Daniel Amen or Amen, who wrote the Daniel Plan. I, I heard him at a conference. I, he walked us through this with one of his patients with um, well, he was autistic, I take that back. Severely autistic at 18 months. By the time he was five, he was normal. He fixed his, fixed his gut. We saw the videos of this kid progress as he treated the gut. Okay, so this is the largest inter, inter, uh, environmental interface of our body. So we think our skin is what is interfaces the world. No, it's our gut because the gut is much bigger than the surface area of the skin. And 70% of our immune system lines the gut. It should, though, right? That's where most of the things that get into our body come in is in, in through the gut, the intestinal tract. Okay, and we know the brain and gut communicate because we know depression can be related to the gut. Hel um, mental illness can be related to gut. We know if you're really scared, if you're really worried about speaking in public and you're scared to death, you're going to be in the bathroom doing things that you wouldn't do normally because that it'll just speed things up okay so we talked about this we talked about anxiety and hopefully you remembered that there are more bacteria in our in our gut than there are cells in our body so you, we each walk around with a name identity my name's Tim I should say my name's Tim and their name is bacteria because there's a lot more of them than me <laughs> but we that's okay they're there to help us, but we want to make sure they're good, healthy bacteria. Okay, so we talked about celiac, well, we didn't talk about celiac disease. I think we talked about it on the video. In 1975, the prevalence uh, of celiac disease was pretty low, but we've, we've doubled the, the prevalence of celiac disease every 15 years. So this is an inflammatory problem of the gut. So since 1975, something is inflaming our guts. So now, one in 100, have at least gluten intolerance, which is the beginning stage of celiac disease. It may never get worse than that, but you eat too much bread and you have diarrhea and bloating and gas and you don't feel good. And why is this? It's because of the way our food industry has changed wheat gluten. Gluten is a protein in wheat. Gluten is what keeps the bread sticky when you make it. It's what holds the bread in place structurally so it doesn't collapse, like, so you don't have a hard brick. It, it, structure but that gluten protein has been changed by the way we've modified genetically modified the wheat plant um, and it's completely different there's a lot more of this gluten than there, what nature intended it to be we also have more problem with celiac disease because we're not breastfeeding um, I, I've never had to breastfeed I don't I don't know how hard that is but, you know, a hundred years ago when you didn't have Similac and all these other options, you figured out a way to make it work, right? Or you did something. And that's really what nature intended you to do. Uh, but breastfeeding puts a lot of healthy bacteria in the gut uh, for the infants. And then there's a change in the gut microbiome, the healthy bacteria. These are the things that cause this. So right now I'm taking a low-dose methylprednisolone for my elbow. I don't have any, I don't have any joint pain. Uh, my energy is better, I need less sleep. This inflammation is, is improving, but this is not healthy for my gut. So I am feeding bad bacteria with this. So I really need to be on a probiotic. And I'll tell you, 
my bowels have not been moving quite the same since I've been taking this. Um, taking too many antibiotics will kill these healthy bacteria in your gut. And then these medicines we use for acid reflux can also alter the bacterial population in the gut. All these things take the healthy bacteria and kind of throw, the, throw more weeds in the garden than, than the healthy plants you want. So the, the way you fix this is always address the root cause. So the root cause is put healthy bacteria in the gut. And the best way to do that is plant-based foods. A second way to do that is with probiotics. So let's, let's give you some bacteria. But we don't know which bacteria you really need. There's 100 different bacteria. You might be okay on 80 of them, but 10 of them, you got way too many, and, and the other 10, you don't have near enough. And you don't know when you get a probiotic if you're getting the ones you need. At some point, we'll have the technology to get a stool sample and say, okay, these are the five you need. We're gonna write a custom prescription with these five. But right now, we just say, here, just shotgun, take a, take a bunch of these. Just take one of these a day, we'll give you everything. Doesn't, we don't know if that's what you need. So I'll say, get a bottle of a good probiotic that's refrigerated, take it, from, take it till it's gone, and then when you get a refill or when you go back, get a different brand with a different mix and then a different brand again. And maybe do that for six months and eat right and your gut should be pretty balanced by then. Okay, so these are foods that age us, right? And hopefully you, we kind of beat that in you in week four. Okay, and what do genetically modifying grades do to us? They destroy the healthy gut lining. We call this leaky gut. And they strain our antioxidant defense system. So when the gut starts to leak, that means there's holes in the gut because you've completely destroyed the lining, not completely, but you've microscopically des destroyed the healthy lining. So when I see somebody that comes in with a weird rash, um, the first thing I think of is, well, first of all, I think is, is it something that they touched, you know, a contact dermatitis, poison ivy or something that's irritating their skin. But there's no answer there. I'm thinking their gut's off. They got a problem with a gut. We got to fix that because the skin is an indicator of the health of the gut. And if you've got rashes on your skin, your gut is probably not as healthy as it should be. So the one way we get rid of these environmental toxins is this acronym PURE. We can sweat them out, we can urinate it, we can eliminate it through bowel movements, and we can breathe out some of it. But the best way is through our bowel movements. Mm -hmm. So we know that the liver, that's the liver's primary job, is to, is to check everything you eat and, and run it through the liver and say, good or bad. Okay, bad, bad, good, good. You guys get to go in the blood. You guys, we don't know what you are. If you're a, if you're a fat soluble bad molecule like a, uh, like a, um, um, a pesticide, then this system goes into play. It says, okay, you're fat soluble. These, this is the way we're gonna get rid of you. We're gonna, we're gonna go through these processes and then we're going to uh, bind you with something else in phase two. We're gonna bind you with one of these molecules so you can excrete it in your bowel movements. If you're a water-soluble bad guy, then you go through this, this phase two reaction here. And we know in phase one and phase two, there are certain nutrients needed to really clean the liver and make this process run well. So as you look at this, um, you can see that there's some common vitamins and, and minerals that are needed. Can you see the B, how important the B vitamins are here? Uh, folic acid is a B vitamin. Glutathione is the major antioxidant in the liver. It's an excellent antioxidant. You gotta keep the glutathione healthy and that requires some selenium and many of us are low in selenium. Um, so these are some supplements that can help you. Milk, thist milk thistle, selenium. Cruciferous vegetables are the ones that are stinky. They have a lot of sulfur in them. Okay, so anything that you know, makes your house stink like cauliflower, broccoli and kale, uh, those are really good. And then N-acetylcysteine is, is a great supplement that helps a, a strained or toxic liver to recover. That's the one we give you when you've had a Tylenol overdose. So any questions on this, on how the liver works and how it gets rid of the bad stuff? It's a pretty cool system. So what happens when you drink too much alcohol? 
or you have a fatty liver, because I showed you the fatty liver. What happens to these reactions when the liver is strained or struggling? It doesn't work as well, and you want it to work well. What happens when your liver has cirrhosis? That liver sample I showed you that was cirrhotic, looks like cobblestone. What does that tell you about the way this works? When you're to that point, this doesn't work very well at all. And these people with, with um, cirrhotic livers, these toxins build up and they just become very sleepy. And they basically kind of sleep until they die because of the buildup of the toxins. Okay, so we don't want that. So you've got a fatty liver, you've got to reverse it by eating healthy and losing some of the belly weight so that you never have to worry about this. This is another reason why fasting is so important. These, this, this liver is always working. And like your brain gets a break, your muscles get a break. Your liver doesn't get a break unless you give it a break by not eating. So that's a benefit to the liver. Just give it a break, let it recharge and recover. Okay, so how do we enhance the health of our gut? Well, we limit the things that that can uh, cause it to be stressed, and then we choose foods that can help it heal. Okay, other ways that we can do this. Uh, drink clean water, fast regularly, I mentioned. We can detoxify with these, these vegetables, and then the supplements that were on the other slide. We wanna have healthy bowel movements. That's a sign of a good health. So uh, healthy bowel movements should be, it doesn't matter how often, it doesn't have to be every day or twice a day, but it should be soft, it should pass easily, you should sit down and go, and it should slide out, and you should feel empty and better. But if, if it looks like, you know, you look at the toilet, it looks like a, a deer just stopped by and emptied little round pellets, that's not healthy for us. Right? Kelly likes it when I talk about that, so. <laughs> she keeps thinking, you're not gonna, you're gonna stop talking about that one day. <laughs> All right, so we can heal the gut also with probiotics, but high fiber foods is a way, if you drink enough water, the fiber uh, will attract the water and that gives it bulk, that makes it soft. So don't eat high fiber foods or don't take a stool softener and not drink enough water. The, the lady, was, the guy was talking about tonight, his wife was not drinking enough water. You, you take the stool softeners and drink enough water to give it some bulk and make it soft. And then you want to avoid these things because these toxins are not good for the gut. Okay, some more on healing the gut here. Uh, colorful plants. You, when you look at your plate, you want to see a lot of colorful foods. Try to change it up. I know we get stuck on just, you know, I got my green salad mix. That's my go-to. Then I'll throw in some broccoli or cauliflower, but then I'll see what you guys are making. I'm like, that looks really good, but I gotta get that recipe and buy all that stuff at the store. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all need uh, you know, encouragement and, and new ideas. Um, supplements can help you. Um, and I, what's in dark are the ones that are probably the most important for our overall health. But now you can see that, I've told you about B-complex, how it helps to lower your homocysteine, reduce your risk of heart disease. But now, if you remember, I just showed you that B, B vitamins are good for the liver. Um, and vitamin D is important for the liver. Magnesium is important. So it's all, it's, it's not like you need a whole bunch of these different supplements. Okay, and then what we need to do is, is start eating to live and not just living for the next meal because we're going to eat something that we really love that's not the best for us. Um, nature's foods, the foods in the produce section, have captured the sun's energy and they're storing that energy for you. And all you have to do is chew it and swallow it, let your digestive system work, and you'll extract that energy and the nutrients that nature wants you to have. And uh, we can measure that. So they should be rich in fiber. And they'll have enzymes in them because they're, they're live plants. These plants are, they have enzymes. Um, you've, seen the, you've seen the images of like a McDonald's hamburger, they take a picture of it today and then two years later it looks the same. You know why it doesn't break down? There's no enzymes in it. If there were enzymes in it, if it was still raw meat, there'd be enzymes and it would degrade quickly. But there's, and, and when you see something like that, you know that's going to be hard to digest. 
hard to really absorb the nutrients. But you leave a tomato on the, you know, on the vine too long, it'll rot and get disgusting. Um, that's, that's, you don't eat that, but you eat the raw, healthy tomato. Did I tell you about my daughter, Katie? With her, <laughs> I'll have to introduce you to Katie sometime. She's, she's my middle daughter. She is the typical blonde. She just does the blondest thing. So funny. <laughs> so her brother was driving the car, and they were sharing this car when they were in high school. And my son, Andrew, is a slob. I mean, he just, he, that's not the only way they put it. So, you know, he would have dirty gym clothes in the car and, you know, just throw stuff in and there's trash everywhere. And then Katie would drive it every now and then. And she just got used to his trash. And she was driving at one time and it was like, this car really stinks. But Andrew just, he needs to get those gym clothes out of here. They've been here since, you know, this was like in March. They've been here since last fall. He's got dirty socks and shoes in the trunk. So she started going through to try to clean this stuff out. <laughs> and she, when she, she unpiled all the stuff. Underneath all these clothes was a liquefied pumpkin from Thanksgiving. From, yeah, Thanksgiving. <laughs> so <laughs> my, it was awful. It was really hard to clean it. But why did that pumpkin turn into a, a liquid mess? It, was a, it had enzymes. It was a live plant. Okay, we, That's not what we eat, but that's a good type of food to eat because it's, it's a live plant enzyme. Okay, so these packaged foods are dead foods. You, you get Fritos in a, in a vending machine and leave them there for a year, they'll look the same. You get an apple from a vending machine, a year later it's not going to look the same. Okay, let's see if we can keep moving here. So this, these are the right foods, right? We've kind of beat this uh, dead horse. Um, these are the vegetables, just a list of some of the vegetables. I just put this up here to maybe help you recognize a couple of vegetables that you haven't thought of that maybe you would like to try. Here's some of the fruits. What's the best, uh, what are the best fruits as far as a family? Berries, right? Because they're low in sugar and rich in antioxidants. Okay. The high sugar ones that we like, that's okay, but the sugar, if we're trying to lose weight, makes it harder. Bananas and pineapples and oranges. It's not that they're taboo, but they have more sugar. Okay, and then we, had, we talked about proteins. So I'm not, I'm not really propo uh, proposing that we eat a vegetarian diet. I think that's tricky to do. Some people do that well, but it's, it's pretty tough for us. But I think most of us eat way too much uh, animal flesh. So there's different, uh, this list just shows you different types of protein sources. And then uh, when you look at this image, I love this, um, how much meat do you need? Look at the muscle on these animals. And where do they get the muscle from? Where do they get their protein from? It's from plants, right? So the mess, and if you look at their teeth, their teeth look more like our teeth. If you look at a cat who is going to eat as a carnivore, uh, it looks different. So we should be eating a lot more plant food than we do. I'm not sure these animals ever eat animal flesh, uh, but they have plenty of muscle mass. And we're capable of doing the same with the right type of uh, diet. So we talked about your protein requirements. And we need that for all these reasons. Um, some of us need it more than others. So uh, some of us need to try to eat a little bit more protein. So you can calculate this based on this formula. So this is your ideal body weight. So if your ideal body weight's 150, and you can have half of that in protein, that'd be 75 grams a day. Or you could go as low as like 42 or something, or whatever that would be, 37 grams a day. So 37 to 75 grams a day if your ideal body weight's 150. That's not a lot of protein. Oh, there's the example. Man, it made this hard. 160 pounds, so 40 to 80 grams a day. Now, some of us who are trying to build more muscle might need a little bit more protein. Um, but bodybuilders, I, I'm telling you, I, I, and powerlifters, I've been around them. I've, I've watched what they can become with the way they train and with their protein intake. But protein is, are made up of amino acids and you don't want a lot of acids in your body. And if you follow the lifespan of a bodybuilder or a powerlifter, as they get older, they, to me, 
they, they decline quickly as far as the aging process. Their joints are bad, their muscles are tight, they have a lot of pain. I think they age quicker. I don't think we should be eating the meat like these professional athletes eat. I just think there's a price to be paid. Okay, so is everybody comfortable with figuring out your relative protein intake based on this? All right. Then we come back to the right grains. Uh, we, this, we have to have a little bit of this, but we don't want to have a lot. What's Ezekiel bread? Ezekiel bread is made from, um, I think it's bean sprouts, right? I think that's the, pro the carbohydrate source, yeah. So that's low in carbohydrates. It's kind of like uh, substituting almond milk for milk. It's, it's close, but you can tell it's not the same. It's refrigerated, yeah, yeah, it's because it, it, yeah, man, I was at Walmart Saturday and we couldn't even find just plain old yogurt. I mean, those shelves are really bare there. So this is the list of healing foods. So, you know, hopefully we've helped you understand that. Oops, let me go back here. Okay, foods that help you heal. So this guy, Frank Medrano, if, if you, anybody likes this kind of stuff, Google his name and watch one of his videos. I mean, he does things that defies gravity, and he's vegetarian. So he's got plenty of muscle. Uh, he, doesn't eat, he doesn't eat protein. Uh, and then we got two uh, athletes, uh, Carl Lewis, who was a gold medalist about 20, 30 years ago. Um, he's, uh, he does not eat. He's a vegan. And then um, Patrick... Uh, Bamboian, st uh, strongman champion in 2005, uh, is now a vegan. And you can see some of his stuff too. And he was in a, uh, in a movie called The Game Changers, if you like that kind of stuff. So the point here is you, you don't have to eat a lot of protein to develop big muscles. Um, a lot of this has to do with their genetics too, and also the way they train. But we don't need as much protein as people think we do. Okay, so we talked about the right amounts. You have these displays over here to kind of give you some ideas as to what those look like. Um, I, in the work, in the, uh, the journal, there's a section on here that kind of shows you some of these sample plans. This was made several years ago when we were still kind of giving you, my mind hadn't really clicked that we're not really counting calories, we're counting grams of carbs more than anything. So a 1200 calorie diet though, um, this is kind of what that would look like. Is it possible to gain weight on a 1,200 calorie diet? Yes. How would you do it? Storing fat. Say that again. Keto acid. Keto. Oh, that would get you down, right? You probably, if you get down to, you know, 500, 600 calories, you'd be in ketosis. And what did you say? Said sugars and carbohydrates. Yeah, eating sugars. Yeah, 1,200 calories of carbs. Yeah. That's all you eat. What if you ate? Um, what if you ate protein, just a protein diet, and just a little bit of uh, carbs, maybe a little bit of vegetables? Could you gain weight on twelve hundred calories? There is a way to do it. You know how you do it. What's the hormone that makes you make fat? It starts with an I. Insulin. Yeah. So what happens to a diabetic who's on insulin? They're going to eat, right? If they eat and they take insulin, they're going to get heavier. It just makes fat. So we give you a pretty healthy diet, maybe this diet, but we give you insulin with it, you probably gain fat. So you don't, you don't, you're right, it's back to the carbs. You don't want carbs if you're trying to keep your weight down, at least not a lot of carbs. Okay, so this, this is a 1,200 calorie diet. Um, I, w I showed you this Lose It app. Um, this is how I... <laughs> tra track my food intake and this is just showing you one of uh, my days with this so trying to keep mine ideally down to about 50 grams of carbs a day and you can see on this app it's a free app but if you really want to follow your carbs you have to pay a fee to, to get all the bells and whistles with it um, so this day this is my summary I had 45 grams of carbs 50% of my diet that day, calories was from fat, 21% from protein. So then you say, well, you know, what did you eat? I think I have that on here. 
Okay. Let's see. What's this one? Okay, that's basically the same summary. I'm hoping I showed you. Okay, yeah. This, this will show you what I had to eat that day. Um, so I skipped breakfast. My lunch was uh, uh, a, a, a nut and dried fruit mix, a fourth of a cup. So it was, um, you, you can create these recipes in this app so it knows if I, you, you put like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this recipe. My recipe has uh, two tablespoons of almonds, a, a tablespoon of cashews, uh, a tablespoon of craisins, uh, two teaspoons of um, sunflower seeds, and you, you put that in, and then it, you just say how much you ate, and it'll, it'll calculate this for you. So it just, it just knows that that's what I would eat. If I, if I had twice that, then I would say, okay, I had a half a cup, and it would just automatically multiply it. And then I have a salad that I uh, mix, a, a green salad mix, and I usually put some, some nuts in it, um, and maybe uh, some berries and uh, little cashews or something. So it kind of knows. So I had a, a three quarters of a serving there, and that was 370, 307 calories with the dressing. And then um, this premier protein drink that you can get at Sam's Club was uh, 11 ounces and 160 grams. And the reason I like this is it's a lot of protein, but not many carbs. You got a question on that? Yeah. Is that like Boost and Ensure, same kind of stuff? Or? Uh, it's a it's, it's similar idea, yeah. Uh, Boost and Ensure has more sugar in it, though. This has um, an artificial sweetener, which is sucralose, which isn't really the best. I mean, Splenda, is, it's not really the best. So uh, low in carbs, but probably not something that you want to be on long term. Um, but I've tried some of the, I don't know if some of you have tried these protein powder drinks, chocolate protein powder with, you know, a, a scoop with 12 ounces of water or skim milk or something. And to me, it just takes like, you know, a puddle, like the, just a chocolate. It doesn't taste that great. You drink it because it's supposed to be healthy, but you don't sip on it and enjoy it, you know. So I wanted something that I could enjoy without the carbs. Okay, so that was my lunch. And then for dinner... I had uh, this. So three cups of cauliflower rice, some Brussels sprouts. I don't know how I ended up with a, an ounce of chicken breast and some teriyaki chicken. I think, I think that was in the drawer in the, in the refrigerator and then this was part of, my, uh, part of this meal. But that was not a lot, it was 150 calories, right? So my caloric intake this day was pretty low. Um, but you can see my carb intake was 45 grams, right? There's not a lot of carbs in that. But, and I was okay with that. I wasn't starving with that. And the reason I wasn't starving is that the days preceding that, I wasn't eating a lot of sugar. So that's how you get rid of that uh, appetite, is not eating the carbs and sugar. Okay, so yeah, that was uh, 998 calories total. Yeah, this, this broke down the carbs, which is 45 grams. Okay, now we talked about weight loss hormones too, right? We've kind of, I'm just, re, just kind of a quick review because it's not just insulin, there's other hormones involved. Insulin makes fat. Um, bodybuilders, did you know bodybuilders take insulin when they're serious about bodybuilding? And I've talked to them. They'll say, you cannot believe how much our muscles grow on insulin. Insulin is a growth factor for muscle and fat when you're training the right way. You have to, they have to be really careful, though, because they can die from too much insulin because they're not taking hardly any carbs. They know carbs will make fat. So they don't eat carbs, and they take insulin to make their muscles grow. And if they don't do it right, they'll die. So it's very dangerous but you can get some pretty big muscle growth with insulin. Um, but insulin, we know, makes fat. Cortisol is a stress hormone, and that makes fat. So the more stressed you are, um, and really it's not if you're stressed or not, it's if, if you think you're stressed, because most of the time stress is something we create. That um, will cause you to make fat. And then ghrelin is that hormone in your uh, brain that makes your stomach growl, makes you hungry. And when you fast and you eat low-carb meals, it has 
it has very little impact. You don't make much of it, so you're not hungry. And then leptin is the hormone that says, I'm full. I, 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 think, I think of leptin, I think of it closes my lips, so I don't feel like I need to eat. And that, that works also the same way by keeping your carb intake down. And then thyroid, you guys measure, well, you didn't measure that. Some of you have measured it. Uh, but you want your thyroid to be optimal. A low thyroid means your metabolism is sluggish. But this isn't really the way to lose weight. This is just a way to another piece of the puzzle to optimize your weight loss. But testosterone and estrogen can really help you. So I saw a guy today who was 40, I think he's 45. His testosterone was low and he hadn't seen him for two months. He said, I feel great. He said, I, uh, I, I showed off to my wife. I was lifting weights and I, I hadn't lifted this since I was in college playing football. I, I lifted 300, I bench pressed 305 pounds five times. Um, and he was really proud of himself because the, his strength had come back. And I asked him about his weight. He goes, well, I've gained 12 pounds. I said, well, that's a lot of weight in three months. He said, but my waist is thinner and I'm, I'm bigger in my arms and shoulders. So it's just redistributed. He, he looks thinner and trimmer because he's lost the belly weight. This same thing happens with women when you don't make estrogen. And if, like I said before, if you're 30 and having periods and we take your ovaries out, by the time you're 50, you're going you're gonna to look like a menopausal woman with, most of you will, with a weight gain around the middle. And your risk of heart disease goes up, diabetes, yeah, you just don't feel good. Yes? So if you take insulin, what's the secret to losing weight? Um, well, so, good question. Uh, what you want to do if, is, is eat the foods we're talking about and and watch your insulin intake because as you start eating right and eat less carbohydrates and sugars, your insulin requirement will fall. You'll need less and less, which is what you want, right? You don't want to, you don't want to have your insulin drop, your blood sugar drop, and then say, I know how to fix that, I'll get a candy bar. Because then you're feeding the fat. So you just want to slowly lose weight, make sure you cut down on your insulin as you do. And some people, if they lose enough weight, they'll get off the insulin. Most people that develop diabetes later in life, if you're a juvenile onset diabetic, you're going to be on insulin forever. But if you gain, if you develop it later in life, uh, you start on pills and then you go to insulin. If you eat right and you lose enough weight, you're likely to at some point get off the insulin and just manage it maybe with a couple of pills. Okay, does that, does that help you? I mean, you have to, it's just eating right and being careful that as you're losing weight, you're not taking too much insulin. For a diabetic, it's always better to be a little high on their sugar than low, right? Because that's a terrible feeling. You, you feel very insecure when it drops in the middle of the night. Okay. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, more about weight loss. So this by now, you should understand all of this. And I, I did give you a handout that when I walked in, that you probably, if you didn't get it, you can get on your way out. This is kind of a summary on, on some of the stuff on weight loss, how to lose weight. So again, the carb intake is the key. If you have your doctor measure your fasting insulin level, you want it below five, that's the target. So here's one way you can eat. Now this is kind of the old way. I thought it was okay. I used to think it was okay to just snack and nibble through the day. And that was a popular way to lose weight, right? You're eating good, but you're just eating small amounts through the day. But every time you eat, unless you're eating just like a keto diet, fats and protein, every time you eat, you're gonna have some carbs, and this represents a spike in your blood sugar, which is also means a spike in your insulin levels. So here is maybe a half a bagel for breakfast, and um, I don't know, something, maybe some berries for a mid-snack. And then here's a, a sandwich, and then in the afternoon you have an orange. And then here's dinner, and there's some popcorn. You know, maybe not the worst uh, sequence of foods, but when your insulin level is high like this, this is, this, you got a 12 hours here where you're, 14 hours where you're making fat. And then you go to bed at night and you're not eating, your, and your insulin level drops, and um, that's when you would lose fat. But if you, if you add these two up, you're making more insulin than the insulin is low. So this, when you've got a lot of these lines above the curve, 
more so than these, you're going to be gaining weight. That's all he's trying to depict with that. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about that next week. You'll, you'll be able to answer that, but um, it's, uh, it's net carbs, actually, because net carbs are the ones that have calories in them. It's like fiber that you don't absorb. That's, that's not a carbohydrate. It's going to affect your insulin. That's a good question, though. Okay, so here's, here's another way to look at this. <coughs> this is the benefit of fasting all day, like, a, like the uh, intermittent fast. You don't, eat, you don't eat breakfast. At lunchtime, you eat. Your insulin level is going to go up even, on a hel on, even with salad and maybe some croutons on it. It's just, it's just going to happen. But then you stop eating, and now your insulin level is dropping. So you got more time during that 24-hour period where the insulin level is low. And when insulin is low, you, make, you increase your leptin. It says I'm full, and you, you actually, you, yeah, uh, you'll decrease the ghrelin, which says, I'm, I'm not hungry. But when your insulin is high, these are what the hormones do. You have more insulin to make fat. Ghrelin says, I'm hungry. You're going to feel hungry here, and then you have to suppress it. Does that make sense? So the key is, if you're going to use the intermittent fasting diet program, that's why it works. It keeps your insulin level down more. Now, my brother was kind of teasing me, but, you know, McKnight's had this really bad carbohydrate gene, I think. <laughs> so, he said, we were going to go to somebody's house last night and uh, have, a, have a little lesson, a message, and then a snack. And he knew the snack was going to be good. So he said, I did my intermittent fasting. I planned it, that I was going to eat lunch at 2, and then I'd have this snack about 8, and I would finish my intermittent fasting. Because I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me what I eat during the intermittent fast. Well, that's one way to look at it, but it's, it's harder. Because if you... If you eat a lot of carbs here, let's say you have three or four pieces of bread, you're going to be pretty hungry in this part of the day. If this is a salad and some healthy proteins, healthy fat, you won't be as hungry. So you, this works best if you keep your carb intake down. So then we talked about um, the intermittent fasting. It's, it's not about starving, uh, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. Fasting is about training your body to eat when it needs food and then fast for long periods of time to control the insulin levels. Ideally, it's 18 to 36 hours. Some of you are like, I couldn't, I can't do it for 18. Yes, you can. <laughs> You've done 24 hours. The, the more you get away from the carbs, the easier this gets. And then your body, like anything else, says, I got you figured out. You're only gonna give me these six hours to eat. Okay, I'm done responding to that, what you're doing to me. So now you have to outsmart the body, just like you would if you're lifting weights. Uh, you say, no, I'm, I'm going 24 hours. I'm going to do a 24-hour fast two times this week. You have no idea what's coming. And that will freak the body out and says, okay, i got to respond to this. And then you might throw in a 48-hour fast at some point. And you'll find when you do that, if you're doing this gradually, it's not as hard as you think it would be. That's how you really get the weight off quickly. But it's, it's a gradual process. You don't jump into a 48-hour fast. You, you feel awful. Okay, this is just showing you um, what, four, that four days of fasting actually increases your metabolism by 12%. And I know this is a little, uh, a little tricky here, but don't get too confused by these numbers. So this, oops, right here is the weight that you lose in four days of fasting. You go from 64 kilos down to six, 61 kilos, so that's three, three kilos. It's about eight pounds you'll lose in, in a four-day four days of fasting. Most of that's water, some of it's fat. Um, this is your, your metabolic rate here. See how that goes up in four days? Now, if you do the keto diet, um, which is all fat, you're, you're, it's probably going to drop your metabolic rate. So that's why I'm not really a fan of the keto diet. But this actually, we know it enhances your metabolic rate, which is really good. Okay, so let's see. There's the other one here. Yes, this showing the same kind of information. And you can see how the insulin level drops. That's what you want it to do. Um, you can see that as you go on, you're burning more ketones, which is okay, and you're burning, uh, you're burning some fatty acids here as, as this progresses. And that means you're burning fat. 
So the longer you go, the more fat you burn. Okay, and this is another one that says fasting doesn't burn muscle even after 70 days. Um, I don't think this is a, was this a 70 day fast? I don't think this is a 70 day fast. Weight loss. It's just, I think it's a, it's a low, boy, I should have looked this closer. I think it's just a, a, a low carb diet. So what they're showing you here is uh, on day 14 compared to uh, the end of this period, 70 days, they've lost from 43 to 38 kilos. So that's, uh, that's five kilos, that's about uh, 12 pounds. And then the fat, there's no change in your fat. I'm sorry, no change in your muscle. You don't lose muscle. So this, this intermittent fasting, you do not lose muscle. You lose muscle on a keto diet. So these people, they just, they, they just look kind of gaunt. Their skin sags, they, they've lost some muscle. Yeah, they're trimmer, but they still, they're a little big here, their arms are skinny. That's not how you want to do it. it it's not an effective what, what way. What is a 70 day fat? I don't get it. What's that? <clears throat> what is a 70 day fast? You don't eat for 70 days? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what know, that was. Is there intervals in between, I hope. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think there was. I think so. That would be. Yeah, 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 that, that wouldn't make sense. You wouldn't do a 70 day fast. I don't think you'd get anybody to do that. So I apologize, I need to go look at that and see exactly what they're, how they did that. Okay, I was just trying to point out that you'll, you burn fat, but not muscle, you won't lose muscle. Okay, so here's a couple ways you could do an 18 hour fast. Um, that's probably a good way to do it, just skip breakfast for a week. And then you can switch this up and then you can throw in your 24 hour fast. So right, whoops, shoot. Right here is your 24 hour fast. There's another 24 hour fast. There's, an, there's another one. And you don't have to do it that often. I'm just saying it's an example of how to do it. This is a, how you might think of a 36 hour fast. Okay, and then you can do alternates. So the whole idea is you, you can fuse your body. You're always kind of mixing it up. All right, so we talked about this. These are the foods that you need. Some general guidelines. Um, I'm not going to read those because we already went over this. So if you're trying to lose weight, uh, if you're, if you're going to lose it, use a calorie intake. Um, I tried to come up with the best estimates that I could based on your, your age and your overall activity level for weight loss, but it's got to be the right mix of foods that, like we've been talking about. Does anybody have any questions on that? Because unless you, you yeah. <clears throat> or if you want to gain a few pounds, which categories would you increase calories in? Um, I would pro I'd probably increase a, a, an extra serving of carbs right here because remember that's gonna make you make a little bit of insulin and that if you're exercising in particular, you put some muscle on. So I'd probably do one more serving of carb and one more protein to do that. Any other questions on this? It's a little, maybe a little confusing, but I, I don't want you to get hung up on it. Okay. And then the, the right times. Um, I used to think you should, you know, research said you lose weight better if you don't, if you eat breakfast. I'm not sure if that's true. I, I know the intermittent fasting is a really effective way to lose weight. So I would say that's an easy one to skip. Okay. Um, this, you got to watch the afternoon when you get tired or oh, you're bored. You have to watch the evening after dinner when you feel like you, you deserve something rewarding. <laughs> All right, so this week, um, we're just gonna cut, try to cut back on some of the animal flesh, the, diet, the dairy intake. And for those, if you, if you don't have diverticulosis, or you don't have problems with diverticulitis, then it's okay to eat nuts and seeds. But if you've, if you've had problems with that, you probably ought to not do that. The best way to get those foods is like a nut butter. But you don't want little chunks of seeds and nuts in your intestinal diverticuli that can cause problems okay so Kelly did, oh next week we're talking about um,
food labels. This is kind of cool because we're gonna you're gonna we're gonna apply everything you've learned the last three weeks about nutrition, and you'll see how this you've learned how much you've really learned, and how this all comes together. And you'll be really you'll look at a label and you'll be like, well, now I understand that, and, and uh, I can make better choices because of what we've learned. Kelly, did you have some questions? Yeah, we had a couple online questions. Okay. Um, the first one is, what is the best way to add minerals back into my RO water, which I'm assuming, or we were guessing, reverse osmosis. reverse osmosis. I read that organic pink Himalayan salt will do this, but I noticed that it does not dissolve well. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what minerals are in Himalayan salt. I don't know if there's... I mean, there's obviously sodium and, and chloride, but I don't know if there's magnesium, calcium. I'm not sure. I don't know of a good way to do that with reverse osmosis. But uh, so you could you could uh, have like bone broth, make bone broth. You get a lot of good minerals and nutrients that way. I wouldn't worry so much about adding the minerals back to the water. I would try to get it in my diet and maybe in bone broth. And the second question was when fasting, um, you're allowed water, can you have broths and tea? Yeah, I think you can. I, you just don't want a lot of calories during that fast. So you need to hydrate yourself really well, but just don't have calories in your drinks. Uh, like a Bud Light, yeah, probably do. <laughs> just a small one. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that next week, too. Those are sugar alcohols, um, and on your tongue, they're, they're non-caloric. On your tongue, they taste, your, your, your tongue says, I think that's sweet. So it, it tastes sweet. So for the sweet, sweet tooth, it's satisfying. And it's okay to eat that, those uh, sugar alcohols. The only caution is if you eat a lot of them, it can make you really gassy because your bacteria will feed on that and make a lot of gas. So... As long as you're not gassy and your friends still like you. Okay. <laughs> yes. I have two questions. And I'm trying to think of fasting to heal my gut and my liver, but I'm diabetic and I don't know how to do it. Okay. So are you on insulin? No, I'm not. Okay. Paleo. Okay. So what I would do is um, just don't take your diabetic medicine those days. Yeah, because it, I mean, your sugar will probably, it's, I, I doubt that it's going to come crashing down. Um, but you might want to have something handy just in case you feel that. But yeah, you should be okay. And the other question is um, I don't have heart disease, but I'm on Robostatin 40 milligrams. Is that a good one to be on, or should I not be on it? Um, that's one of the mildest. So. Uh, it causes the least amount of side effects, sore muscles, and liver problems, but it ha it, it's one of the less effective at lowering your cholesterol. So if you don't have known heart disease, that's what I was saying. Why would you take I wouldn't take it. I mean, somebody's going to see your cholesterol level and get all upset that it's high and we got to fix it, but we don't always have to fix it. And you know, if I haven't said this before, some of you, you know, this, this concern about heart disease and blockages or strokes is real because so many people have it. If you, if you have reasons to think you might be having an issue, you got high blood pressure or high cholesterol or smoking or diabetes, or there's a strong family history and you're like, yeah, I, I still have risk factors for heart disease. What I would say is go get a CAT scan of your chest, of your heart. It's called a CTA of the chest with contrast. They do them at Mercy, and that looks at your coronary arteries, and it'll come back and tell you how much blockage you have in each of the major arteries. That's better than a heart cath. Well, it's as good as a heart cath. I've had a heart cath. Okay. Um, so how long ago was a heart cath? Last April. Okay, so that's probably a pretty, if that was pretty good, then you, and you don't have heart disease, there's no reason for you to take it. The reason they want you to take it is because you're diabetic. and. That's just a blanket statement. You're diabetic, you take this, this, or this, and you take a statin. That makes them feel better. But it doesn't, to me, it doesn't mean you need to take it. And if we know there's no blockage in there, there's really no point. You, you know, you can have your cholesterol where it is. Everything else, you know, you just do the other healthy things. But I'm just telling all of you to do that. Uh, if you're concerned, I've done that twice because of my, my parents' history of open heart surgery. 
I had a guy who was a diabetic. Some of you, I know a lot of, some of you would know him. Um, pretty healthy guy. He was not really compliant with his diet, always eating the wrong stuff. Sugar was never really tightly controlled. And I'm like, geez, I don't know why your, your, your liver's not bad and your cholesterol should be a lot worse and why you don't have any kidney problems because you've had this for a long time and you don't take care of yourself. I said, let's do a CAT scan of your chest and see what's going on. He had 99, 95, and 95% blockages. I said, oh gosh, we got to get you into somebody. And um, then something happened. He ended up in the hospital. He went home. This is like within six weeks. He went home for a different issue, had a bunch of fluid, 17 pounds of fluid he gained. Went back to the hospital. He was in congestive heart failure. Heart cast said, we can't fix this. You have, your blockages are so extensive, there's no place to bypass this too. So we, we probably did that in time to prevent him from having a heart attack, but we didn't get it done early enough to reverse the problem. So to me, that CAT scan is, is a really good way to screen, just for some peace of mind if you're worried about it, because it's really a, it's a good test. A lot of times insurance won't cover it, so it's about $1,000 out of pocket. But if you've got a concern, and that'll help you rest and not work, lose sleep, that's, that's a worthwhile test to get. I found that most people don't take statins correctly. <coughs> even, even if yeah. you're on a statin, you have to take it by itself. Right. One hour before or one hour after everything else. Yes. So you just take your nightly meds, if you're taking your statins and everything else, you're taking it all together. Yeah. It's a binder, it binds with everything else, we, and you just loop it out. I, I just <laughs> took care of a patient in the hospital recently who came in with very, very low blood sugars, I mean, in the 40s, and they kept dropping, dropping, dropping. And the story was um, they didn't realize he couldn't read or write, and he just knew, I take the pink pill and the purple pill and the green pill at this time, just take them, take them. He didn't even know what they were for, and he didn't really even have diabetes. And it was just, <laughs> people have a hard time taking medicine, especially when you get older. It gets confusing. So that has to be monitored really close, and a lot of us don't do a good enough job monitoring it. Okay, any other questions? I know we kind of went over. All right, we'll see you next.